my name is Nathan Felnitsky, and I'm a backend infrastructure team lead at Wix.com. And my team is in charge of data, stream, uh, data streaming infrastructure, which is implemented uh, in Zeo. And we have a lot of use cases where we run, uh, we fork long running fibers. So I wanted uh, to share with you today lessons learned from our production uh, experience on how to successfully manage a Zeo fibers lifecycle. But first, uh, a few words about Wix. So Wix is a website building platform where you can manage your online presence and also manage your business online. And we have more than 200 million registered users, more than 100 million websites um, running Wix. So it's a huge platform at huge scale. And so today we're gonna to talk about fibers. So you will learn what is a fiber, um, how you can handle unexpected failures, um, how can you successfully, gracefully interrupt a fiber, and also how can you monitor fiber state in order to gain a lot of production insight uh, from your Zio application. But first, um, what is a fiber? So it's a lightweight concurrency mechanism. Uh, you can think about uh, it as a green thread, where unlike uh, traditional JVM threads, um, it uses uh, almost no memory. Uh, basically, it is run and managed by the zero runtime. So, of course, it doesn't uh, block and you don't waste resources. Uh, um, the zero runtime knows just to suspend the fiber when it's inactive. Uh, fiber uh, scheduling is actually uh, cooperatively yielding. So you can multitask even on a single thread and single JVM threads with, with multiple fibers. And they will be garbage collected when the uh, when they uh, are suspended and they are unreachable, basically. So uh, we have a lot of power with fibers and also a lot of responsibility. Let's look at a, a, a very simple code example of actually uh, forking a fiber. So we have our application. We we are want to uh, run on. We are running on our main fiber but we also want to execute something in parallel in a different fiber. So we, we execute the wrong something effect uh, with, via a fork operation on a separate fiber. And then we are running something and run something else uh, simultaneously on two fibers. And once run something else completes and we want to wait for the result of the fiber that we forked, we call join. And now uh, we are back to single fiber and we can continue operating our application while using the result of uh, the forked fiber. But usually you would want to work with higher level operators um, because this is quite a, a low level uh, doing these forks. Uh, it's less elegant and, uh, and readable. So you can use zero for each par to, in order to do parallel work on collection items or zip par in order to perform multiple zero effects in parallel. And the great operator race where you can run two effects simultaneously and cancel the slower running operation once the faster one completes. So all of these are great higher level constructs that can really make your code super readable and super powerful. But for some use cases, you still want to, to work uh, with the, the fork operator. And we also have a different flavor, which is fork daemon. In this case, when you fork uh, the fiber, it is actually attached to the global scope of your application, meaning that um, it is, has its own life cycle. So if we do regular forks, like you can see here, uh, when we fork uh, A, then um, when we interrupt the, this uh, parent fork, this, these parent fibers, sorry, then the child fibers uh, that we forked without fork daemon, just regular fork, are attached to these parent uh, fibers. So they will also be interrupted when we interrupt the parent fiber. Unlike the situation when we call fork daemon, in this case, when we interrupt uh, the original fiber here, 
the fourth demon fiber is attached to global globoscope. It's not attached to the this fiber B, so it won't be interrupted. It will continue to run until it is completed. So now we know about how to actually fork jobs to run in the background. But when is that really interesting? Well, you can think about situations where you want to periodically update your application state in your database according to the up-to-date data. And that is a great thing to do in the background, right? In order to not interrupt other tasks your application has. But we want to make sure that this periodic task that's running in the background uh, doesn't get interrupted even if there is some unexpected failure. Because hopefully we want to make, make uh, believe that this failure will be temporary and will be recoverable. And so uh, we won't need to do a manual intervention. It'll, there'll be self-healing and this background fiber job will continue to run uninterruptedly. So how do we make sure that this job will continue to run for the entire life cycle of our application. Well, let's look at some code example. We have here um, a simulation of running some periodic job. We schedule uh, with great scheduling mechanisms that Zio offers, uh, when to run the job, and uh, then we fork it. We fork it, it's run in the background, and we can do other stuff in our application. Now, if we want to make sure that this job uh, doesn't uh, get uh, finished uh, on, on failures uh, because uh, we want it to continue processing and hopefully recover, then we want, of course, to catch all the errors, all the zero errors, right? And um, that's what we do. And it's pretty good, but um, we have a case here where we're going to get unexpected failure. Here you can see we are using uh, Zio pure operator zs.succeed, but inside the, the code actually throws uh, a Java style runtime exception. So this is an impure uh, operation, which means that uh, it, this um, becomes an unexpected failure and this fiber should die. Now you may say, oh, this is a toy example, but you know, when you have bigger and bigger code base, and you have interrupt with all kinds of libraries, including Java libraries, you may end up uh, calling some something that is not pure uh, with the pure operator. So this stuff can definitely happen and has happened at Wix for sure. Now, what will happen here? Um, the fiber uh, is going to die unexpectedly. And uh, you see that there are no more log entries for um, for this uh, job operating, only other stuff the application is doing. But this is not what we wanted to do. We cat caught all errors, right? So catching using catch all doesn't really catch all failures. You want to uh, use catch all cause. So you have the zero error type E, right? And that is only for representing expected failures. We have cause of E that this describes the full story of a failure, including the regular expected failures, but also die events in case of unexpected failures, and also when a fiber is interrupted. So let's see what happens when we actually change catch all to catch all cause. Let's look at our log output. So here we see that um, the job continues to run even though there was an unexpected failure. And we see the description uh, of the, the cause object and it has uh, the die enum because uh, it, was, it has basically died unexpectedly, but we catched it, we caught it. So hopefully uh, this was a temporary issue and uh, we will be able to overcome this and the job continue to run in the background and do its operation without needing any manual intervention. Now, if you want to have a little bit better clarity in your logs, you can do cause.squash trace and it will convert the cause object to a throwable object. And then you have the nicer uh, regular stack trace without any wrappers. 
And also, if you have your application working with some monitoring service, for instance, New Relic, Datadog, or uh, Grafana, whatever, and you want to make sure that unexpected failures, uh, these uh, fiber dying situations, are reported, um, then even though you forgot to catch it somewhere, uh, then you need to specify report failure and when you specify the platform for your zero runtime. And here you can just um, do your custom logic on reporting to your favorite monitoring service um, how to um, report about this unexpected failure, which is basically a bug that you want to fix, right? Okay, cool. So now let's switch gears and talk about fiber interruption. There are such situations where you would definitely want to interrupt a fiber. One classic example is when you're working with a managed resource and this managed resource not only, I don't know, created a file or a socket, but it also forked a, a fiber during the acquire phase. So during the release phase, what you wanna do is you want to interrupt the fiber in order to close everything up nicely. So here we see an example of uh, running uh, our background fiber, some long running job, and we interrupt it. Now, and an interesting point that we can do here is we can use zero ensuring clause in order to make sure that we do some cleanup operation when the fiber is interrupted. So in this case, we just printed the log, but you can think about cleaning up some resources uh, when the fiber is interrupted. So uh, there won't be any resource leakage. And here we can actually see that when we called fiber interrupt, it immediately interrupted after we finished doing stuff and before doing other stuff and the ensuring clause uh, was uh, invoked as expected. But what if we wanted to offer a grace period? You know, maybe the fiber is currently doing stuff um, that uh, we wanted to finish, like we can add like a, a Boolean flag to so say, okay, finish what you're doing now, but next don't do anything more and offer a grace period. So how can we do that? Basically, we wanna run the same job, but not immediately interrupt it, but offer uh, a timeout. And of course, Zio offers a timeout operator and you, do, you don't just uh, invoke timeout on a, on a background fiber that's running. First, you need to join it. And uh, so you're actually running in the context of the fiber. Then what you wanna do is you wanna call resurrect. Resurrect actually will convert any unexpected uh, failures, die events to regular throwable events, uh, similarly to catch all cause, what it does. So now including um, uh, the squash of uh, the, the stack trace. So now we, we actually have a regular zero error and we want to ignore it because we don't want the failure to propagate. We just want to time out. And then we actually disconnect uh, the fiber in order to make sure that the timeout happens even if for some reason the fiber has some um, uninterruptible phase. And then what remains to be done is to clean up. So if the, the fiber um, elapsed the entire timeout here, so it's five seconds, that means the timeout will be none and it returns uh, none, which is empty. Then we will need to actually kill the fiber ungracefully because the full five seconds have completed. So we're going to do interrupt fork here in order to make sure that interruption is done on the background and we're not waiting for some stock operation that may take a long time to be released and then we'll completely stock our program. So instead we just do interrupt fork. And if you look at the log output, then we definitely see here that the output of the ensuring clause when the fiber was interrupted indeed only happened after the five seconds grace period that in, in our situation, in, in this example, um, the fiber didn't complete, so we had to kill it. 
Great. So the last part of this talk is monitoring fiber state, which is really crucial for debuggability and understanding in depth what happens to your Z application in, uh, in production environment. Now, good old Java thread dumps uh, won't really help you a lot in case of a full Z application because it doesn't really have any information on the Z fiber level. So you can know that the fiber of Java thread dump Java thread is maybe blocked, but not a lot more than that. So you really want to utilize Zio fiber dumps in order to get more insights. And of course, stack traces, which is amazing. So here we see an example of the Zio fiber dump. At first you get um, a list of all of the various fibers and their current states. So some of them are running some of them are suspended, of course. And after that, for each specific fiber, you get the amazing Zio stack trace, including the next um, effect that should have happened uh, after, that should happen after the current effect and get a lot of very cool insights. Now, how do you actually able to do these fiber dumps? So there's the Zio ZMix project that uh, is uh, named after JMix, getting diagnostics uh, in Zio style. And all you have to do is uh, attach the diagnostics layer to your Zio environment of your application. And for the Zio runtime, you want to add the additional supervisor, which is the Z ZMix supervisor. So it supervises all uh, the fibers and has access to them. And then you will be able to run uh, on the client side and request to get dumps. Or you can also roll your own uh, implementation on your application. Basically, all you need to do here is get your uh, supervisor out from the runtime, and then you can provide it to your own fiber tra tracking logic and put it part of the Z environment. Now, all you have to do is implement some HTTP service of your own or gRPC service with an endpoint that allows you to do uh, fiber dumps on your own. And you can access all of the fiber information from this supervisor. Okay, so uh, that's uh, all the information I wanted to give about fibers today. So to summarize, we talked about what is a fiber the low level fork or fork daemon, the higher level constructs uh, like parallel for each that allows you, for each part that allows you to uh, do concurrent work with fibers uh, being created behind the scenes. We're handling unexpected failures with catch all cause and clean up with ensuring and report failures to never miss any unexpected failure that your application threw and also how to gracefully interrupt fiber, including using resurrect clause and uh, interrupt fork and disconnect, all very important to make sure that you always uh, succeed and no unexpected uh, failure there. And also very importantly, how to monitor fiber state, how to get important insights and debug your application in production uh, by using a ZMX supervisor or your own kind of supervisor. So this talk uh, was based on this blog post and you have the link uh, here if you want to get more uh, in-depth uh, details. And I also highly recommend for you to check out Greyhound, which is our zeo based high-level SDK for Kafka, including great uh, features like um, deciding on the level of parallelism for each of your Kubernetes pods. So I want to do more parallel work or less parallel work for the partitions I'm assigned on in the consumer. And also batch consumer, Greyhound Health is batch consuming where you can work and process messages in batches to increase uh, traffic uh, throughput. And also all kinds of reach by policies to guarantee successful completion of your data processing in your distributed environment. Of course, it can really help you a lot and all kinds of other great features all written in Zio. So I highly recommend for you to check it out. 
And I put all the links and slides on SlideShare. So you don't need to remember everything. You can just go to SlideShare uh, with my name. And I really like to thank you very much. And I would like to uh, ask you if you want to uh, check out previous blog posts I gave and talks I gave in conferences. You can check out my website at natansil.com. Of course, follow me on Twitter and LinkedIn. And to get updates on everything we're up to on Zeal, on Scala, on um, data streaming, and Kafka event-driven design, on uh, key value stores and caches, and software engineering uh, in general. So uh, you can uh, follow me there. And I uh, would love to answer any question if there are any. With first applause, yay! <laughs> Thank you so much, Nathan. That was, that was great. Uh, and I have a microphone for people here, as usual. I'll football it to anyone. Uh, I think we had a couple of online questions, which, and I think, maybe you address this, but um, can you log unexpected failures to a logging system, uh, which Grafana isn't? So yes, do we have flexibility for logging these unexpected failures to other places? Well. Yeah, just give a reminder that we're talking about mm -hmm. uh, read reports failure mm -hmm. uh, that you put in the runtime map platform. So even if it's uh, unexpected, you can still log it here. That's great. And I think in ZO2, there might be, hopefully we're making that even a little nicer with customizable logging backends, but the same power is there. Uh, yeah, and that's that a great be tip cool. because if these demons die in the background, you know, you want your demons to scream on their way out. Uh, Otherwise, Definitely. it could be very confusing. Uh, maybe we should have something that just automatically does that in, in, in dev mode without configuration. But uh, uh, can you highlight the difference between resurrect and catch all cause again? Uh, someone, uh, Ahmad asks. Sure. Sure. So uh, with catch all cause, basically, um, you, you will use that when you want to handle unexpected failures and also offer some. Um, handling logic here, right? Uh, I want to do this and that, and then um, after I after this uh, point, there is no more. Uh, the error is is uh, actually um, swollen, and we continue with the success channel. Now, if we look at uh, resurrect here, so here we we simply. Um, switch from, we convert any unexpected failure to, um, to a throwable. So you can do dot resurrect dot catch all now, if you prefer, because you can do catch all. If you do catch all here, it's fine because every unexpected failure will be turned into a regular zero error and you can handle that. Or you can use dot ignore and just simply ignore it. So I think it basically, so it really works nicely. Resurrect.ignore is a nice pattern, or you can do catch all cause. Basically, they're very, quite similar with very nuanced differences. Yeah, if you're familiar with the dot either operator on Z, right, it takes the E and, and moves it into the, the result channel inside of an either, so now it can't fail. And resurrect sort of does the same thing except one level lower. It takes the defect, which is not represented in the type signature, and lifts that up into the error channel. Uh, as long as you have a, I guess, a throwable error. It sounds like it, it unifies it under that. Um, and John has clarified in the chat that in ZO2, uh, the, the uh, defects, failures uh, on demons will be, unexpected failures will be logged automatically. So that's nice. So you don't have to worry about that edge case, but you can still customize how they're reported by overriding the, uh, the platform. Yeah, if you want custom reporting, but that sounds great. Yeah, it'll definitely, yeah, because that's, when, when that starts happening, it could be confusing. Um, and people are complimenting you on your clarity and precision and other things. Uh, I don't, I think we might be out of questions though, unless someone wants a mic here. Well, the Zio community is very kind. <laughs> uh, oh no, someone wants to start a fight. Uh, let's see, a uh, question for Nathan. Uh, you mentioned Wix's Greyhound library for Kafka. For which use cases would you recommend this over Zio Kafka? So yes, Greyhound versus Zio Kafka. <laughs> uh, well, more. I think Zio, Zio Kafka is more, uh, has like a streaming pattern. So if you want to set up 
if you want if you like working with streaming and it works um, well for you and um, you have like processing in stages like pipelining and, and stuff like that then it will be great for you i think with greyhound if you have a lot of side effects a lot of uh, like writing to database or calling a grpc requests and stuff like that maybe you prefer to work with the more classic uh, consumer style operations and then um, that will be a bit more natural i think i think that's the the main difference awesome uh, well, thank you so much, very much. That was awesome. Yay. <laughs>